all here. Number one, I'm Mary Jane Burke, County Superintendent. I want you to count on us um, in real time to be prepared to provide any and all information that we can uh, in order to keep our kids and families safe. So that's number one. Uh, number two, um, this is actually going to be video, our new standard. We're going to be actually providing a video of this. It will be put online. We're ultimately going to translate it so it will be available for people who are unable to be here or a way for families to access who might not be willing to come to a public meeting, right? So that's number two for your information. If you can keep your ear to the ground um, and keep us posted about <coughs> needs that you see arise, move them forward. Melissa Guerrero, right there, Melissa Guerrero is our point person. Um, and then I just want to say that, but for our relationship <coughs> with the Canal Community Alliance, there is no way that we would be able to um, provide such important information to the students and their families and our community at large. So Lucia, Lauren, welcome, and we're really excited to have you. So thank you again. So let's hear it for the Canal Community Alliance. So hello, everyone. A lot of you have seen me before, but my name is Lucia Martel Dow, and now I am the Director of Immigration and Social Services at Canal Alliance. So I have now the responsibility to oversee not only our legal immigration team, but also social services and behavioral health programs. With me today is Lauren Silver. She is our new legal outreach coordinator. And she is um, going to be the main point person for community education and outreach with the Marion County. So if you work in schools, and if you would like us to bring presentations either in English or Spanish, we have a full-time position in her role to actually bring that information. So don't hesitate to reach out if you need to coordinate any events. And that includes also things about knowing your rights, not only for people out of their home, but we can also provide a basic overview of know your rights for employers as well. So thank you, Mary Jane, for inviting us and having always the space available to us to bring information out to the community. Uh, there's a lot has been happening, <laughs> but it's interesting because I've been doing this since the election, and I hate to always go back to that, but it seems like life is before and after a little bit, specifically for us at Canal Lines. It seems that the last year has been uh, particularly um, wild. And just an overview, a little bit of what kind of offers of, uh, <coughs> services we provide at Canal Alliance. And we will start with a little introduction of what we do. And at the end, what I would like to bring all the way is the last timeline of what has been happening in immigration. Because if I started in 2016, you probably are very much aware of a lot of things have happened. But in the last six months, and I will bring some information about the most recent news, so that probably is what a lot of people have in their minds, which is the proposed rules that were announced around public charge. So the presentation today will have a timeline of the immigration updates and then we will end with what's happening with public charge. So that you are informed and can bring that information to the families and the students and the people that you will work with. So what uh, services does Canal Alliance provide for immigration? So we provide mostly what's called, or what we like to call humanitarian relief options which are usually U visas, which is for people that have been victims of crimes. So also it's good for you to know, if you're interacting with a family and one of the family members have been victim of a crime, and not only folks that are undocumented, but even US citizen children that have been victims of crimes, if they're minors and their parents are undocumented, they can actually be petitioned their parents as US citizens because they have been victims of crimes. So it's not every crime, it's we're talking about serious offenses. So it could be robbery, it could be sexual assault, domestic violence, we see a lot of that. And um, not because it's prevalent, but because that's one of the ways that people can actually get um, access to a legal path. There's very little options for folks who are undocumented, and that's one of the, the humanitarian um, paths that are available to people. The other one is T-Visa, which is, stands for trafficking, victims of trafficking, human trafficking, and also labor trafficking. 
So it means for folks that have been that have come into United States, maybe because they are going to be exported at a sweatshop, or if they are going to be here providing, um, because they're going to be um, slaved into sex trafficking. And also VAWA, Violence Against Women, which came it was Women Act, which is a law that passed and allowed. Um, women or even men now that are documented and married to a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident, they can also um, get some protection and a path to a lawful permanent residency and citizenship. Um, something that you as educators may be more familiar with of the work that we do, which is Special Immigrant Juvenile Status and Asylum for Minors. And this is what I pause for a little bit because one of the things that we have seen is that um, some people are not aware that children that have been abused or neglected by one or two parents or are here by themselves may also be eligible for the special status that leads to a green card. So that you have a little bit of perspective of what's happening. This came about becoming much more popular. This remedy has been in the books for a long time, but because of the search that happened in 2014, the search of unaccompanied minors that happened in 2014 that were pouring uh, at the border, and um, these children were obviously escaping violence um, and conditions in their countries that wouldn't allow them to be there, and sometimes they were there by themselves, sometimes with one parent, and they're known as the unaccompanied minors, and a lot of also remo removal defense. What that means is they're actually being in the process of being deported. And I'm going to go back a little bit to this when we talk about family separation because it's semi-related. But that's something that we have seen in Marin County, and so that you know, Canal Alliance has one of the largest caseloads of unaccompanied minors in the Bay Area. Marin County, despite that we are not a very large in terms of population, we are the only. We were the only nonprofit. Now, Family Children's Law Center provides a special immigrant juvenile status uh, assistance for the immigration part, and we are the only ones who still represent them in removal. So the last, the first year we saw in 2014 around the search, there were about 140 children that came to Marin County. At least that we identified, they were unaccompanied. We know they're identified because they're the ones that were caught at the border or they turned themselves at the border, and then they were released to sponsors in Marin County. The last year, despite the rhetoric and everything that has been happening at the border, Marin County received 90 unaccompanied minors. So they're still coming by themselves, alone, despite what's happening at the border, because their conditions in their country are so bad that they still even prefer to be detained at a shelter at the border and try to make it to a family member or a sponsor here in the United States. So it's good to know that those things are out there so that if you see children that are in these conditions, that you know that they may be eligible for something and send us to, to Canal Alliance. And asylum probably something that people are a little bit more familiar with, has to do with those people that have been persecuted in their home country. And it's related to national origin, um, race, and, and this, there's a lot of controversy around this belonging to a special group around domestic violence. And this is something that a lot of immigration practitioners, we are scrambling right now because um, up to now, victims of domestic abuse, of the women victims of domestic abuse in their home countries were eligible to apply for asylum in the United States and the administration is trying to basically um, get rid of that. So it's, it's really complicated. But for children, if you see that they are afraid to go back to their home country, there also may be a remedy, a remedy for them. And then, obviously, the spectrum, the ideal situation where we want folks to be is they want them to be U.S. citizens. Because that's the status that really protects them. If you are a U.S. citizen, you cannot be deported. Of course, I'm always have to put like a caveat asterisk <laughs> to a lot of these things because we have seen also the people who are U.S. citizens now they want to take the citizenship away. But I don't want to freak out people about this because this is just another scare tactic. There is a task force around this issue that's trying to find people that supposedly gain citizenship through fraudulent means to go after them. But this is not something so broad that I want to bring panic, but you probably have seen the headlines so that's why I'm bringing it up. But this is a very important part of what we do. And we'll talk more about what Canal is doing in terms of naturalization and why you should also tell everybody you know is a lawful permanent resident to naturalize. And we also do a community education, as I just mentioned, and 
other things such as DACA renewals, protected uh, TPS, although um, most of the people that were eligible for TPS, that program has been canceled, and renewals in general of green cards and work permits. Uh, what's not there is family-based petitions. We do some family-based petitions. That's when you, for example, a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident and want to petition a family member, either here or abroad. And we do not so much of those because our focus right now is on humanitarian relief. And so if the next slide, oh, the other, I forgot. So yeah. So another thing that I want to let you know about Canal Alliance is now I have this dual role in which I not only oversee the legal team, but I, we also offer all sorts of services to provide people with this wraparound and comprehensive approach. In fact, this morning we have our clinician here with us who provides behavioral health support to a lot of our clients. Oh, will be. <laughs> and we provide also the full pantry, job application support, and referrals, and all sorts of services. And we even own housing. I don't know if you knew that, but we own, I think, about 12 units in the canal. So we have, it's a, it's a well, very well kept secret. Um, but it's interesting <laughs> because we, I know, but we are also very interested in the housing issues. And that's in part why, not only because it really affects our families, but it's um, something that we are actually involved in. We're landlords. And without everything else, we're also landlords. Um, so, and by the way, if you want to interrupt me, please do. Raise your hand. I have no issues. If you would like to make this interactive, we don't have to wait until the end. So if something comes to your mind, or well, I'm not articulating this in a way that makes sense for you, please raise your hand and I'll be happy to, to clarify. All right. So let me take a deep breath because Lauren worked to get this migration policy timeline only from April 2018 as of today. And when she put this together, then we realized there are things that are not here. <laughs> so this is not even the full picture. But I would like to walk you a little bit into what our lives has been <laughs> for the, for, since April. And we're not even talking about the Muslim ban and all the things that have happened since um, the election and in terms of immigration. So I mean, well, one of the reasons why we also decided to win since three, and through, from April is because obviously that's when um, parents uh, started to be separated from their children at the border. Um, or maybe we should start not saying separate, maybe we should basically ripping them apart from their parents at the border. And they're under their zero tolerance policy. What's interesting is that the government at the time said that there was no policy supporting children. But now we know because a lot of advocates actually requested a FOIA. I don't know if you know what a FOIA is, but it's a Freedom of Information Act request. And it's just to get paperwork from the government. And we saw emails and documents internal from DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, that spelled out how they were actually going to implement this no policy that they had, and how they also had no plans whatsoever on how they were gonna reunify the children that they were being separated from their, from their parents. So that happened in April. Of course, it's had a huge impact on the headlines and everybody's mind, mobilization, and the way, um, and so something that is, but it was not here, but in, I think around August, there was a settlement around these cases, um, around the 2,500 uh, children that were separated from the parents and how they were gonna go back um, and be reunited, reunited. And then in May, the TPS, which is Temporary Protective Status, I don't know if you're familiar with TPS, this is just, um, a relief afforded to those people that the government considers are coming from countries that have experienced catastrophes, and um, it could be a humanitarian catastrophe, so it could be something related to a hurricane, an earthquake, like what happened in Haiti. And, and what the government has been doing for the past year is canceling these programs um, for people from Honduras, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. So just to put it in perspective, we had about 250 clients that we helped last year to help with the renewals of their TPS. So this is people that are living in our community right now who have been here since 2000, because these countries were designated as part of TPS since the 2000, early 2000, and they have been making a living in society. They have US citizen children, and they have been told that the work permit and their permission to stay in the United States is going to expire next year. And they have to leave. 
The last one was for Honduras, and nationally we have about 57,000 Honduras who will lose status by 2020. After that, the Supreme Court came up with a decision upholding the third version of the Muslim ban. They, call it, they don't want to call it Muslim ban because they included a country, Venezuela, which is where I'm from, <laughs> to the, of the whole, because one of the things they tried to do is to make it sound like he was not against certain countries from a, that were um, a Muslim population. And they included countries like Vine in North Korea. And, um, well, my country now is the United States, but one of them. I'm also a dual citizen. And, and, but the thing is that they included Venezuela, but only people that work in certain roles in the government. So it's not, doesn't go for everybody as to what happens with the, with the Muslim ban. And then after that, this could be a little confusing for folks, but actually this is a very important thing that happened for petitioners, is that when you apply for an immigration remedy, certain immigration remedies, what we used to tell our clients was, Immigration, USCIS, which is United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, it's an agency separate from ICE. ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, is the agency that really is in charge of deporting folks and deporting people from the United States. So if you apply with USCIS, which is the agency you submit your paperwork to gain an immigration <coughs> relief, your information was not going to be sent out to ICE to issue a deportation order if your case was going to be denied. So as practitioners, we were telling people, for example, people under U visa and people that were undocumented, it's okay, let's try, although we are not going to be submitting fraudulent, or not fraudulent, but things that are not with sufficient merit. So something in immigration that practitioners know that you, if you submit something with immigration, you have to do it because that person has merit. Now, there's a lot of discretion within immigration of what cases they approve and what cases they don't, they don't approve. So, but if, if under that discretion, the adjudicator now in immigration says, I'm not gonna approve your case, now they want to say, well, it can, that person can be put in proceedings. NTA is what is called notice to appear. And it's basically an order to go and show up in front of an immigration judge because you're gonna start removal proceedings against you. Of course, they issued this memo, we were all freaking out, and then, because they have no way to implement it, they backtracked. Which is, the, unfortunately, one of the MOs of this administration is that they throw a policy out there and they don't know exactly how they're gonna implement it and they have to backtrack again. So, the memo we think is gonna be issued again, and thankfully, I think U visas, I think humanitarian reliefs are gonna be exempt, and DACA, for example, are also exempt. So even if you file a DACA renewal and you get denied for whatever reason, the good news says that DACA is exempt for that. So you're not gonna be put in deportation proceedings just because you get a DACA um, denial. So far. <laughs> so far, excellent, yes, yes, so far. Everything is so far. <laughs> As of we know today. Uh, so again, so if there's a video, please make sure that you know the date because everything I'm saying right now could be changing in six months. Um, so in July 2026, we know that um, the government failed to meet that uh, deadline that the court put to uh, reunify children with their parents. I think the last, I was looking at it last night, and my understanding is that there are, uh, let me just go and check real quick. So right now, there are 136 children still in custody and not eligible to reunification with their children under the settlement. And three of those are kids under five year old, under five, um, under five. And parents of 96 of those kids are already being deported. So it's really complicated because if your parents are already deported, how is it that you're gonna go about that reunification? I mean, you could do it. It's just a matter of will, locating and working with other governments. The problem is that I'm not sure the will is there. But at least we have made some improvements. Although I have to say that, as we know, the trauma inflicted to these children is going to be long-lasting. The damage is going to be very difficult to be reversed after this. Um, so as I said before, the NTA memorandum is being uh, delayed. Then what happened is that we knew that the federal courts say that uh, we were going to allow um, DACA renewals to continue. So everybody thought, and uh, me, myself included, that the judge in Texas that was overseeing some of the lawsuits, because there were lawsuits all over the place, all over the United States, we all thought that the judge in Texas was going to favor the government's argument, and they were going to stop accepting DACA renewals. Well, actually, the judge said, this is, 
I think use an expression, it's like this is an egg that has been scrambled and you cannot scramble it. I mean, once, once this has been accepting renewals from USCIS and once this, um, we have, you have a, a, another order saying that you have to accept renewals, it will put immigration and even the government in a terrible position because you will have three conflicting decisions from different judges and how is immigration even going to know exactly how to go about this? So the judge said, it, it makes no sense for us to say that now you're not going to accept renewals, but initials are still are out the window. So we continue to, to and, and we'll, Laura's going to talk a little bit more about that. And um, so, I'm sorry, there were two, two different court orders. One that says, I'm sorry, the DC is the one that I wanted the DACA uh, initials, and then the one in Texas is the one that said what, what I just mentioned. The DHS proposes, um, some changes to what's called the floor settlement. So why the floor settlement is important, why we bring it up? As people that work with children and with families, um, you're probably very much interested in what the well-being and care of, of children. And maybe even if you're an educator, you work with families who experience attention at some point. It is possible that if you work with families that um, are immigrants, they went through something like this, especially if they were asylum seekers. <coughs> And that decision, is that, that floor settlement is important because there was a lawsuit in the 80s in which I think the ACLU sued the government because of the horrendous conditions in which they were keeping children that were coming to the United States. We're talking about detention with adults. So a 15-year-old, the case that started all this was a 15-year-old, a brave 15-year-old that decided to be the plaintiff for this lawsuit. And she was stripped down naked, I don't know how many times a month. She was detained and put with adults. And the SLU got involved and said, listen, these are children. We cannot put them in this type of conditions. And um, at the end, after a long lawsuit, and you would think this is kind of common sense, right? I mean, you would think a minor with adults in a detention center, you would think that this is really something the government would think it's in their duty to protect minors, but apparently it's not. So we're still in 2018, and this does not seem to be a priority for the government. And the floor settlement was a government settled with uh, the ACLU and other plaintiffs to ensure that children that were detained at the border were separated from adults, that they were under conditions that were basic, food, shelter, um, and they were kept in conditions that were appropriate for children. And also had to do with family detention. So family and children, if they are detained together, you cannot keep them detained um, indefinitely because of the children. So the government wants to get rid of the settlement, wants to issue new rules in which they will be able to keep children and family with children detained until they can process their asylum cases, their asylum claims. Obama tried this, by the way. But what happened was that they, they realized it was a complete disaster because in order to apply for asylum, this is a complicated thing, and you cannot rush. The, if Russian thinks that the border is complicated, you will have to fly immigration judges, you will have to have a whole process. So it is very complicated to do that, but the government is trying to gear towards that system. And that's why it's so worrisome to me. And then the last one is that the DHS recently, of course Saturday, because that's when they do it, Friday and Saturdays, decided to drop a proposed rule on something called public charge. And I'm going to explain a little bit of what that is in a, in, in a while. But this is important because a lot of the things that we have seen goes to the whole rhetoric about people are undocumented, illegal immigration, and all of that. This one actually is an attack on people that are trying to come to the United States legally. So this is not only an attack on undocumented folks, which of course I reject 100%, but what is also interesting about this is that they're going after people that are trying to come to the United States legally. So this is not at the border. This is people that are trying to come to the United States legally. And I think Lauren can talk to you a little bit about, about that. But before we jump, any questions about the timeline? Okay. Hi, all. So I'm going to... Um speak a bit more to DACA. Um, Lucia explained some of the key court decisions, um, but essentially there's been um, three court-imposed uh, rulings that say that DACA needs to continue. Um, and then as Lucia um, spoke to, uh, in Texas, um, the judge also ruled in a way that allows renewals to continue. So as um, folks working with students, um, it's really important to encourage um, 
those who are out, who right now the government isn't um, accepting any initial DACA renew any initial DACA. So people who have not had DACA in the past, right now um, that's not open. Um, but renewal for those who are eligible to renew their DACA and that their DACA expires in the next year, um, we we incur you should encourage them to come um, talk with us. Um, and we can consult if it's the right time for them to renew their DACA. So that's kind of the key thing to know um, around DACA, that renewals continue. And given that it's um, stu students with DACA and all folks with DACA are in a really difficult position because they're in this kind of limbo, um, but at least for now they can renew. Um, and it's important to renew given that it's such a, the, the future of the program is so uncertain. Um, and another, um, most likely one, one or more of the cases will go to the Supreme Court and that's where the final like legality of the program will be decided. You want to talk about the fact that we got financial assistance? To oh yeah, yeah, and that's another important thing is there's a $495 renewal fee um, and at Canal Lines we're able to, for those that need financial assistance, we can completely cover it. Um, so that shouldn't be a barrier for people getting their renewals. Um, I won't get into the, yeah, yeah. I'll leave it there. And then about NAC. Um, so NAC is the New Americans campaign. We actually have Anne Marie here, who um, is part of. Uh, it's a, the New Americans campaign is a collaborative. And Nadia from And Nadia, <laughs> our NAC crew is here. Um, so NAC is um, a nationwide effort. Um, I think it started in 2011, um, but it uh, makes innovations around the way that um, people naturalize. So as Rusia mentioned, naturalization is really key for different reasons. Um, one key thing is that it's the safest status, so um, in terms of um, keep having people stay here and not um, be deported. Another thing, of course, is um, civic engagement. Um, we've been seeing recently that the citizenship, uh, before the applications for citizenship were taking like Three months. Six months. Of years. Six months, um, and now we're seeing it taking about eleven months. Um, so I mean, there's some people that are saying, you know, this is a th it seems questionable because it's keeping a lot of people from voting. Um, but anyway, that's another reason that we're um, so committed to naturalization. Um, so the Marin New Americans campaign started this year, um, just. Earlier this month, we're still in September, earlier this month um, we had our first naturalization clinic and um, we it's going to be an ongoing effort. So um, if you all have uh, parents that um, are legal permanent residents, encourage them to um, see about attending one of these clinics or coming to Canal Alliance um, about naturalization. And yeah, this is an important thing. In over 10,000 legal permanent residents in Marin alone are eligible to become citizens. So we really have to, we're in the, you know, we're in it to get all these people naturalized who want to. Yeah. Yes, and just the, just to recap, the partners is Family and Children's Law Center, uh, the Law Libraries, Marin County Free Library System, Pico Weed, San Rafael Library, and uh, North Marin Community Services, and Canales. All right, so. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here because we talked about deportation and what was happening at the border, but I would like to bring us back to Marin and see what's going on on the ground. Uh, we actually, I'm going to have to correct that because it's December 6th, but there has been no, yeah, this, I found out last night, so it's not your fault. And there are different bills that have been approved, that have been passed in California, the Truth Act, the Trust Act, and more recently, the California Values Act, also known as SB 54. So over the years, even before the election, because let's keep in mind that deportation has been happening in our communities for many years. It just obviously now, it seems that even myself, I've become more aware of what is really happening internally, domestically inside the United States. And the reason why advocates and people have been trying to get this acts and this bill to pass is because the immigration deportation system lacks due process. It is really difficult to navigate 
anybody now under um, the new administration priorities, there's really no priority. Like anybody is a target right now for um, deportation. It's, if you don't have an attorney, it's really difficult to understand what's happening. And they can detain you here, and they can ship you to Arizona. They can put you in detention centers with the rest of the population in um, jail. They can do so many things. And it is, once I started to learn more about the process, I understood why there has been such an effort in California to pass these bills. The main way in which people get deported in the United States is through cooperation with local law enforcement agencies. So ICE only have so many enforcement officers. They cannot go out and deport everybody. If we're talking about 11 million people who are undocumented in the United States for all the people they want to maybe um, go after that may have work permit or legal status, remember, unless you're a US citizen, they can still deport you. Um, so the only way they can actually do the work on the ground is to have the police departments and those people that manage the jail to tell them this person is so documented, you can come and pick them up or and get you know and, and do whatever you need to do with your deportation. And there's a lot of problems with that. I mean, I can go on and on and be an advocate about this. I'm very passionate about this issue. But I'm just gonna give you an overview. In Marin County, for example, there is no deputized immigration officer. So at least I have to say that we are considered between the sanctuary, you know, we have sanctuary policies, where I call sanctuary policies, although we're not necessarily a sanctuary county because no one has said that. And maybe it's even better, I'm not sure, we can discuss that. But there's definitely things that are happening at the county. For example, our law enforcement agents are not going after people because they're undocumented. So in other places in Texas or in Florida, they do have agreements of actually being deputized ICE officers. And that means actually go after people as if they were immigration officers. And you remember the case in Arizona, Maricopa County, the sheriff that was not very popular, with, unless you're, anyway, politics. <laughs> but the, he decided that he was going to cooperate and he was going to stop people, and even racial profiling people, to see where we're undocumented. So we, in Marin County, definitely, that's not what law enforcement does. They don't cooperate with us in that matter. That's not what happens in Marin. Now, what does happen in Marin is that once you get arrested, detained, and there's only one jail in Marin, and you go and um, spend some time at the jail for whatever crime you commit, there is a possibility that you can be detained at the jail. And how does that work? If you haven't been booked in the jail, well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> it's good, but it's really fast. You go in there and they immediately take all of your positions and put your fingerprint, your, your, your thumb in a machine, and you get booked. And that information goes to a national database that to me is really scary because it's a database that has information for DHS and FBI. And they can flag that, that goes straight to ICE, because under DHS, and they flag people they think they want to deport. So for example, if you were detained at the border years ago, and CBP, the Customs and Border Patrol, have a record of you coming in illegally, and maybe you got an old removal order, or at some point you were sent back, there's a record of you. And they know that you tried to commit illegal entry, or that maybe you got an old removal order in the past. So if you are detained at the jail, that database, boom, on the black, and I sends a notification request to the sheriff's office who manages the jail and says, would you please let me know when this person is going to be released so I can pick him up. And they do, they tell them. <laughs> they tell this person is going to be released today at this time, at that time, and so it's very easy for um, ICE officers to come and pick people up. And I don't want to make this about SB 54, Values Act, but it is some protections that people do have. For example, now immigration officers cannot go inside the jail unless people actually consent to it. And this is something that passed years ago. I don't remember if it's the Truth and Trust Act, but there's a lot of protections that people have right now because they don't allow ICE to just go and interview people, which was a way for them to actually um, identify people who could be deportable. So at least there are some protections. And now also, uh, the sheriff is supposed to send information to a family member or to their attorney in case ICE um, is going to pick people up at the jail. 
If you want to learn more about this, there's going to be the Truth Act Community Forum. And this means that if you have been cooperating, if, if a jurisdiction, a locality, has been cooperating with ICE in the past year, then their Board of Supervisors is mandated to convene a forum so the community knows how is that cooperation happening. So you can walk out of here with a different understanding and say, well, the sheriff is looking after our public safety, which is his argument, but maybe you also want to learn more how that process works. Well, this forum is for you. This is going to be, I think, in the evening, 5 o'clock, and it's going to be no end time, comments open for everybody, and of course, I will be there. And so will the sheriff. And did you say it's December 5th or 6th? 6th, yes. I found out last night it's 6th, yes. And we can send information, and, and we probably, we have a website that we're um, developing right now, just for Ice Out of Marine, in full disclosure, I am also the, the co-chair of that initiative, so I'm also doing that. <laughs> and the, the project is just to really bring transparency. I want to know what law enforcement is doing. So regardless of how you feel about this, I think it's important that we understand how that cooperation is working. Because if we criticize the Department of Homeland Security, if we criticize the administration, I think we also have to look inside our own county and see what's going on at the underground level. And just real quick, I think most of you have had this information before. And this is just a recap. And maybe Lauren can just really quickly just go over it. Yeah, and this is the kind of thing that I would be excited to do at your schools with um, families of your schools or at a staff meeting, for example, if you if staff want like a refresher on Know Your Rights. But the idea of this, is, um, I think especially post-election, there's been an emphasis on Know Your Rights, and that's maybe, as Lucia says, why y'all are hopefully familiar with it. But the idea is that everyone, regardless of their... Um, their legal status has certain constitutional rights, so it's Fourth Amendment rights, right? Um, that, for example, and a lot of um, how um, in, in immigra in immigration enforcement operates is kind of um, taking advantage that people don't know these rights. So, for example, if um, ICE comes to someone's home, and to, in the United States, for someone to enter their, your home, they need a judge sign, uh, uh, a warrant signed by a judge, and almost never does I say this. So a lot of our work with um, impacted communities is um, explaining to folks that they have the constitutional right to not open the door. You know, uh, only in certain circumstances, and we explain the nuance of that. Um, so that's one thing. Of course, um, Miranda writes the right to remain silent. You know, an officer starts to say, "Where are you from? Where were you born?" And you can. You, we have these little red cards. I left some here. Um, uh, for y'all to take as many as you want. Um, not to sign anything, this goes back to um, SB 54 a bit and our right, I mean, that's a constitutional <coughs> right to not sign anything, that you, especially that you don't understand it without an attorney. Um, but especially, basically in the jails, um, what has sometimes historically been happening is that people get um, a voluntary departure order. Is that what they They can sign that, yeah. yeah. So, but not, usually not at the jail so much, but in the detention center in San Francisco, from uh -huh. here, or? But basically, my understanding, and correct me if you say that, is that it's something that's kind of saying, like, I voluntarily will, like, uh, be deported. Yeah. So it's education around not signing something that you don't know what it is is super important. And then, of course, um, having people be connected to attorneys. And Lucy, I think this is our next slide, the family yes. awareness. Um, and Lucy can speak to this a bit, or should I go into... Um, so the Marin Rapid Response Network is this is a phone number that... Um, uh, should be like publicized a lot in schools, but this is um, our local um, response network. So if there's ICE activity, this is a number that 24/7 there's a dispatcher, um, and that. So our local network is connected to something called Northern California Immigrant NC Riding, which is Northern California Rapid Response and Immigrant Defense Network. Yeah. So a long acronym. Um, but it's a really wonderful, this is, um, the idea of this network is it's a regional um, effort to, uh, to uh, have the local networks be collaborating together. And we know that ICE um, works um, with a regional strategy. So of course, our defense also has to be regional. And there's, um, through that network, we have um, an emergency attorney that people can get connected with. So these, these kind of, um, having families know that this is a resource in the case of um, a detention um, and that they can get connected through an attorney through these resources is important. Um, and then 
Are, are y'all familiar with um, the Family Preparedness Plan? Yeah? Um, but the idea is, this is, so the Know Your Rights training goes hand in hand with the Family Preparedness, um, which is helping families to, um, of course it's something that none of us want to think about, but if they're, it, the idea is to get, it's, it's, the idea of it is like a plan that we never actually want to exercise, but it's getting as prepared as possible, and if there's a family member at risk of deportation, or more than one, to have a family preparedness plan in place. So that has to do with, um, ha you know, doing the, the live work of, okay, who would pick up my child at school? Um, it's important that um, uh, uh, children have like dual, get their dual citizenship of the home country of their parents, if that's a, if they're in this kind of um, at risk situation, that kind of thing. And it's, it's all these kind of, um, that I'm with this, like all these like steps, of steps that people have to do, but the idea is of course in emergency you don't want to be scrambling to do that, so the idea, and there's a certain level of maybe like ease that it can give to at least know that everything is as in order as it can. Um, so that's the idea of family preparedness. Yes, and just, just a question, do you help folks a little bit with, you, do you work with community that you help them do this? Is this something that you feel like when you talk to families, they, mm -hmm. How do they feel about it? Because I have to say that sometimes they are a little, um, they feel fearful, or even thinking about it. So they, they want to like put it behind them, and they don't want to think about, um, about that. So I encourage people to listen and to see where families are coming from. We cannot remove the sense of agency that people have for themselves but maybe talk to counselors and people that are um, experts about how to talk to families about tough issues and having tough conversations and encourage them to have these things prepared. Um, we, as Lauren said, we don't want to think about the worst, but we do see the worst. I mean, we do see that, it's, it's, it happens. And one of the things that get people more nervous is that what happens if one of the family members get deported. So, Usually, and so that you know what we have seen on the ground, is like ICE usually goes after men. It's usually what happens. And even we have a case in which we, there, there was a family driving, and they detained him, allowed her to leave, even though they knew that she was um, undocumented because they had the children with them. Well, we think that that was the case, God knows. But for ICE, it's really complicated to detain women with children because they have to call Child Protective Services, it's a whole bureaucratic nightmare for them. So I'm not sure they do it because of humanitarian reason or because they just don't want to do the extra work. I'm not sure. But that can change. Although the women, sometimes the caregivers are not the ones supported, it actually happens. And when their rates and employment based, what we have seen in the United States that a lot of women have been picked up, for example, at factories and agriculture sites, and they don't care. So, um, I really encourage you to have those difficult conversations. They can be triggering, they can be difficult. So don't remove the sense of agency. People have to make their own decisions, but if you can encourage them to get prepared, I really, really would like you to do that. All right, any questions so far? I'm gonna to go to the meat of this, which is public charge. Um, so to answer questions you have about all of us, I can always go back to this if you would like, but if you have any other questions, I just have a quick question. Yes, yes. SB 54 was, what was it? So it's the California Values Act. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I did not explain that sufficiently. So that was that came into place was um, started in January first, two thousand eighteen, and it came about for the same reasons that the Truth of the Trust Act, which is to avoid using local resources to cooperate with us. So one of the things that it says is like list a bunch of crimes in which the bill doesn't apply to. <laughs> so it's actually really interesting because at the end what it says, okay, local law enforcement are not gonna notify ICE of a person's release date, for example, which is what I was just describing, unless two exceptions. The information is publicly available to everybody. So why do we do? We put them on our website so they're publicly available. And second, um, if the person falls into some categories of crimes, and they're mostly serious offenses, um, but there's also some other things there. For example, it definitely prohibits um, deputized officers, no 287G contracts, 
Sorry, okay. No 287G contract. So it does provide a list of things that the government, local law enforcement agents cannot do. The other thing supposedly they cannot do is to facilitate transfer requests, which is something, it's a little bit technical and I'm actually working on that right now. Um, but in theory, you should not, as a jail, facilitate or help ICE transfer. You should not, the jail should not be facilitating that transfer to ICE. Unless, again, it falls into some of the categories. So it doesn't say no cooperation at all. So for example, San Francisco, just to bring you a little bit of perspective, San Francisco has a policy of no cooperating period. So ICE cannot go to the jail, even. They, can, they don't even go there. There's no back entrance, there's, there's nothing. They just don't go. Except when it is mandated, which is a certain felony offenses actually do have to cooperate and do turn people over. So it's not like it's never happens. It's just that so far this year, for example, they haven't turned anybody in because they have not fallen into one of those um, serious exceptions of serious felonies. But in Moraine, for example, um, it's a little bit different because regardless of the type of crime, because the dates are publicly available, the release dates, then um, you can provide that information to us. So the bill does say, for example, you do need to contact an attorney or a family member if that person is going to be taken to ICE. You have to let the person at the jail know that they're going to be deported, so there's no surprises for the person detained. And you cannot let interviews happen inside the jail uh, without that person's express consent. So those are very important guarantees that we as Californians have given people, which I believe ensures a certain level of due process for people that are very vulnerable under those circumstances. Yes, Mary. You see, uh, one of the things that would be very helpful, yes. and let's just focus for a minute on the family readiness plan. Yes. Anything that we could have, that we could put online, English, Spanish, available for people to access mm -hmm. in a way that would help facilitate this, so that people know what it is they need to do. And we have some, well, we all do, right? A lot of turnover, people that yeah. may or may not know. Yeah. Um, but in the end, some way that would be not require families to go to a meeting to hear yeah. about it. Yes. So I'm willing to collaborate in any way on that point because I think the more we can get that yeah. into our community at large, the more likely that families would be ready to go. Yes, and that's a very good point because perhaps what we're lacking is giving that information perhaps in Spanish so people can get or can have access to it themselves. We have some resources in our website. It's still kind of a work in progress, I must say, uh, but perhaps we should cooperate. I, I thank you for that, Mary Jane. I think that would be fantastic. There's a lot of resources out there, so I also think what happens is there are too much information sometimes. It's like, so where do I go to get the right thing? Is it a declaration? Is it a, am I giving, give, I'm giving up guardianship, which we absolutely do not recommend that. Um, if Family Children's Law Center can maybe attest to that, Nadia, right? <laughs> so, um, these are the type of things that I, I can see how it's so confusing. So maybe it is that. It's about simplifying the information and have it in one place. And I think the schools are probably the best gear to have that information for educators and administrators and counselors. So does that make sense? So let's let's work on that. Thank you. That that's a great offer. All right. So public charges. Anybody here have heard about public charges? Okay, Mary Jane was helping in the meetings, and we have seniors participating. So, this is just to illustrate the current state of affairs with public charge. A lot of people ask, like, is this government going to know where I am? If I apply for a public benefit, am I going to be deported? I hear clients tell us, for example, people who are eligible for benefits, that they do not want to enroll because they think that they're going to have to be enrolled in the draft and in the military. The level of this information on this issue is been going on for a very long time, and now we're, it's worse. <laughs> and the reason is because the government has used a kind of a dark area of immigration law, and I say that because I, I think a lot of immigration practitioners didn't even know much about public charge, is because it's so rarely applied. It has been the policy for many years that really immigration rarely um, applies this test, among other reasons because it rarely applies to people, very rarely, it's very narrow in scope. So. 
what happened was that the government for the last six months, I think it's on purpose, they have been linking this draft proposed rules to change what public charge is. Now, before I tell you what it is, keep this in mind. Public charge is something that can only, the main things around public charge of who applies to, it can only be changed by Congress. But the government can issue regulations around the public benefits that are considered in the discussion with public charge. Public charge is basically, I don't think we have a definition later on, but what really is, and you can see how this could impact a lot, because about one in four children in the United States have at least one one immigrant parent. So if your immigrant parent is afraid of getting benefits for themselves or for their children, then look at how many people are going to be impacted by this. And the issue is what we call the chilling effect. We are seeing people that are, don't want to apply for benefits or just want to disenroll from benefits. And it may make sense, but most of the time it doesn't make sense to do that. And I'm going to explain why. Public charge only is applied at the time of what we call when you're being admitted to the United States. It's that ground of inadmissibility. That means that you cannot become a lawful permanent resident because you, or when you enter the United States, which for example happens when a family petitions you, you are living abroad and I'm a US citizen and I wanna get my mother here, for example. And that's when the government says, is this person admissible or not? Is this person going to be, I'm gonna allow this person to enter into the United States. And what public charge says is, is this person gonna become primarily dependent on the government if I let this person in the United States. Primarily dependent on the government. So this is complicated to assess because there's a lot of factors that go into this. But one factor they can consider is whether you have, have access to public benefits among all the things. It's a test. But this is what it applies. To enter the US, one example, as I just mentioned, US citizen, getting my mom here, or a spouse that is I'm petitioning a spouse, or when, for example, I get married and I would like to, um, I'm, I'm, for example, I meet someone here who's in a tourist visa or who has a student visa, and then I find the love of my life, like what happened to me, and I get married to a US citizen, and I um, become a lawful permanent resident. That's how I immigrated to the United States. So when my husband petitioned me, I came here on a tourist visa. Yeah, it was very fast. <laughs> it had been 11 years, so it didn't turn out so bad. Um, but uh, I, when, he, when I came here, he actually had to say, I'm going to submit an affidavit of support. I'm going to make sure he doesn't become a public charge of the government. So if she becomes homeless, gets sick, or whatever, I'm signing a contract saying I'm going to pay for her bills, basically. That's how you can get people into the United States. And you have to have a certain level of income to do that. And so that's why for poor people, it's sometimes very hard to bring family members because you have to say, you have to sign a contract saying that you are going to pay for their bills. And just to clarify, this does not apply for naturalization. There's a lot of confusion around this. If you're already a lawful permanent resident, you're eligible for certain benefits, you can continue taking them because that doesn't apply at the time you're gonna become a US citizen, as of right now. In the leaked draft, they wanted to change that, but thankfully the proposed rules did not change that. Um, one little caveat here. If that person has left the country for over six months, they could be potentially subjected to public charge. And that is because lawful permanent residents in general should not live in the United States for over, we don't recommend them for 180 days because they are automatically, they can be considered, um, they can start asking whether they're admissible to the United States <clears throat> or not. So that's a little bit complicated, but the most important thing in general, the advice is that if you have not left the country and you're gonna apply for naturalization, you can continue um, uh, using your, your your public benefits. So, public charge is using usually a, what I call the totality of circumstances. 
So you have to consider different things in order to assess if the person is going to be public charge or not. And who does this? Is the adjudicator in the person in immigration trying to figure out if that person filing a family petition is going to meet some of these um, standards? That's why it's so complicated also for practitioners right now because we are now have to be doing this test to try to make sure that whenever we file a family petition, the person is not gonna become public charge or they doesn't get denied based on public charge. Because what happens is that they can start denying those applications saying, no, I'm not gonna let your wife to immigrate, I'm not gonna let your mom or your children to come to the United States because they're gonna become a public charge. I'm so sorry, I have the clicker. Okay, this is something really important that I think people should be aware of. As I mentioned before, public charge, the people it applies to, can only be changed by Congress. That means that people, remember when I talked in the beginning about humanitarian visas and humanitarian uh, relief? This is how it connects. People who are ASLE, SNJS, UVSA, VAWA, are not subject to public charge. That means if they're eligible for a public benefit, even the public benefits enumerated, and by the way, something else to remember, I will explain it, but not all public benefits are subject to public charge, then they can continue using them. So I don't, although immigration attorneys will tell you all day they need a legal consultation to assess their particular case, yes, everybody, every lawyer in the world will tell you that. Um, but in general, as a community education, it's important that people know that there's a category of immigrants who this doesn't apply to. That doesn't include also DACA people. People have um, uh, DACA active duty service members, although they're trying to strip a lot of um, benefits for people that serve in the military. As I mentioned, a US citizen. And the most important thing, because this is where parents get really worried, in the league drafts, they wanted and this is part of the, the uncertainty that we're living, is that they wanted to include US citizen children taking benefits as part of the public charge consideration for their parents. So even if the parents were not taking public benefits, if the children were getting, let's say, CalFresh, then they wanted to impute that to the parents. Thankfully, I think they realized that it's probably borderline unconstitutional, and they decided to take that from the, from the final proposed rules. Okay, this is the current situation. And again, this is important that we know because not all public benefits are included in the public charge discussion. For example, right now the way it is, the law today, the regulations today, is that only temporary assistance for any families, TANF, and I think in California it's called CalWORKS, general assistance of cash <coughs> assistance, supplemental security income, and long-term government expense, like nursing home, so if you've been um, hospitalized for a long time uh, in a nursing home, psychiatric hospitals, and things like that. That's the law right now. And again, only applies to people who want to enter the United States and apply for lawful permanent residency. So people who are already lawful permanent residents and are getting these benefits, doesn't apply to them. If you're a U visa, doesn't apply to you. If you're an asylee, doesn't apply to you. The proposed change. This is where I took a bit of a deep breath and I was like, okay, when I saw on Saturday, it's not as, it's, it is still terrible, but it's not as bad as the leaked uh, drafts. And it made me think, well, at least still know that they're not all programs are being included. But let's, don't, let's understand that the, the issue here is not necessarily what, got, what benefits are there, but how complex it is to assess some of the situations based on the totality of circumstances test that I just mentioned. So for example, they want to include Medicaid, low income subsidy, like what is called Medicaid Part D, which is basically to buy medication. And one that really scares me is a supplemental nutrition assistance program called SNAP, which in California we know as CalFresh. This is how we know CalFresh. And we know that in Marin County, people at the Department of Health and Human Services have done an incredible job of trying to get people enrolled in CalFresh. So to me, this is one of the things that really worries me because um, a lot of people actually need this to be able to put food on the table. 
and the housing assistance such as Section 8 housing vouchers. So this is among the public benefits that actually are being included. So we're going from here, that was way narrow, to including a lot of people on this. They think about 350,000 people a year will be impacted by this. And again, this is lawful. This is people that are trying to come to the United States lawfully. Yes. You said CalWorks is yes. currently yes. part It's currently CalWorks, yeah. So we in San Rafael City Schools have a large campus mm -hmm. with CalWorks preschool. Does that mean parents that are sending their kids to a CalWorks subsidized preschool? No, because whatever the children get has nothing to do with the parents. So this is one of the main confusion points, and I'm so glad you brought it up, because I wanted to make it very clear to people. In fact, I gave a presentation at a school recently, and I spoke with five moms, most likely low income, and their children, with US citizen children that would, would be eligible for CalFresh as of today, and none of them have applied, and none of them wanted to apply. None of them. So it is confusing because they think if the children apply for benefits, it won't be imputed to them. <coughs> no. It, that was stripped out of the lead from the proposed rules, and the proposed rule says the children con can continue using whatever benefits. It doesn't have anything to do when you're considering public charge for your parents. Now, I would like to say this with all confidence, and I do, but the problem that I'm seeing is that since they're considering a totality of circumstances test, if they feel that your children are in programs, that may not be for you to be public charge, but they may consider that as a negative factor. And I'm not sure about that. So one of the problems that I have with this rule, and I'm gonna be completely honest with everybody, is that it's 447 pages long. It's very complicated. It requires people to know about public benefits and immigration law. And then it has all sorts of conditions that are really confusing to me. It's complicated. There's things that the way I've written, I've been reading it three or four times, and I'm not even sure exactly how they're going to apply that. But at least the basic concept and the basic takeaways that I want you to take today is what is here. Because as community members that are advocating people, it's important that also we try to not get the rumors and the panic. Although I think the panic and rumors are already happening, so maybe it's too late, but shit was said a long time ago. But at least we can try to control some of the rumors and the, and the information that is out there. And if people have questions, again, I'm going back to that sense of agency with, when you're working with, with people, right? You cannot tell them, oh no, you have to enroll because you're eligible. Oh, it's not gonna affect you. I went to this presentation with Canal Alliance and they told me that for sure, this. You have to let people make their own decisions. And not only that, but if they have questions, I will suggest talk to an attorney. What can they do? Come to Canal Alliance. We're gonna start doing uh, workshops, so probably because we have not that much capacity to do individual consultations with non-current clients, we're probably gonna do workshops in which we can assess and do quick 15 consultations, 15 minute consultations with people about whether or not the public charge applies to them. So if, if, if you are given information, people are still not sure, you say consult with an attorney or with a DOJ, which is, stands for Department of Homeland Security, uh, Department of Justice Accredited Representative, like myself, that I can practice immigration law because I, I have this training and accreditation. And those people will be able to assess your case and also can go to Family Children's Law Center that also is doing some immigration work right now. So that is definitely something that I, it can be difficult to talk to families about this, but if you can't give them information, give it to them. And they can then say, well, I will make my own decision based on what works for my family. So how can you fight back? This is a moment where we need you. Because the rule is not gonna be implemented immediately. What's gonna happen is that we're gonna have 60 days to um, comment on this. And the public comments has a lot of good things. You can delay, you can change, you can document, and you can have people actually take action. And that's really important. And maybe we should do us a follow-up, send the link so you can join. Maybe, yeah, the information is right there. Uh -huh, yes, join protectingimmigrantfamilies.org, and this is a national effort, and there's over 1,000 organizations like Canal Alliance nationwide that have signed 
um, statement rejecting the public charge changes, and it will tell you how to make the public comments, and it will send you it straight to a page where you can start uh, making the public comments. They, I think, have to be in English, unfortunately, so only for now, English uh, comments are allowed. They should be unique, and they should definitely be telling a story about a specific things about the rule that may impact your family. Again, this is complicated, but if you can at least speak to some of the things that are on the website, that would be, that would be great. Um, can alliance and agencies themselves can also post public comments, which we obviously plan, plan to do. And this is, if you ask me today what is that I can do, this is what you can do. Because what happens is a lot of things that government does, they put it, they post it for public comments, and people, you know, we're all so busy that nobody really wants to make public comments, so they don't have to respond. But if you make public comments in theory, God knows with this administration, but in theory, they should be responding to those unique, unique comments. Like they did with the FCC. Yeah, like many, exactly. Like many things in the government, the regulations are subject to that. Do you have any questions about this? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I've been trying to follow the public charge information. I'm working with an activist organization in West Korea, and I'm sort of the one who, and I'm not an attorney, has been um, designated to follow this. And I also went on the DHS website and was relieved to see that they took citizen children yes. out of the proposal, yes. out of the change. My question is, do you have an example of, um, of a family who would be yes. affected by yes. this? Yes. A couple examples yes. that I can take back yes. to my group. Excellent question, because in fact, that's one of the things we struggle with. Like, okay, but who does it apply to? <laughs> because we know it doesn't apply to somebody who has a U visa. It doesn't apply to someone who is already a U.S. citizen. And or, you know, and so the a great question. So I'm going to give you an example. Currently, somebody who has temporary protected status, TPS, it doesn't apply to them while they're renewing their TPS status. So it doesn't apply to TPS. But if somebody who has TPS, and only certain circumstances somebody with TPS, can adjust status because, and by the way, TPS like DACA, is, there's no pathway. That's why people have to continuously renew it. So when people say, oh, why somebody has not become a U.S. citizen? Oh, well, but because it's impossible. There's no pathway. Legally, there's no way to become a U.S. citizen from DACA to U.S. citizen. That, that doesn't exist. For TPS, it's the same thing. But there's a little, some exceptions. So for example, if you have a U.S. citizen child who is 21 years old today, and you still have TPS status, and you may be able, eligible for having a family member to petition you, then you are trying to get admitted to the United States, and that's when you may be subjected to public charge, for example. That's one example. Another one would be, as I mentioned in the beginning, trying to petition someone overseas that is trying to seek admission in the United States. That's why you sign the affidavits of support. But you have to also make sure that person has not, is not gonna become a public charge in the United States. And that's, there's another, aspect of public charge that has to do with consular processing for those people that are coming here, but I'm not gonna get you confused with that. <laughs> that's, that's why it's better consult with an attorney for those cases. But another one is, for example, it applies a lot to um, people that are here on employment visas, visas, employment visas, so again, not a lot of the population that we work with. Somebody, I think, with a student visa, for example, if they have had to access some of these programs, I'm not sure they're even eligible for a lot of them anyway. So that also doesn't apply to them. Uh, but in theory, it will be when you have a family petition. So for, and also the issue is that a lot of undocumented people are not even eligible for any of these programs. So if you're undocumented and your child is getting those, there's really no reason why your child should disenroll. And if you have emergency medical, for example, because in some circumstances undocumented people may be eligible for emergency medical, that's not there either. So even if you become eligible because a family member can petition you in years, and then you have to ask for a waiver, the government, please forgive me for being undocumented, which only allows in certain circumstances, that probably would not apply to them. That would not apply to them either. So yes. So it's, thank you. It seems like the, what we need to say is we need to talk about the chilling effect. Yes. And that it's, it's um, preventing families who um, have a, a are, are eligible, legally eligible for these benefits, and it's frightening them, um, and it's discriminating against poor people. 
E exactly, and this is one of my issues is this, is that they, by making it so complicated and making my life so miserable and everybody who's an advocate so miserable, it's because it's complicated and the chilling effect. And also my inability today to tell people, I'm sure you're gonna be fine. Because the problem that I'm seeing is that what is happening with these rules, it's, I know that the government has limitations. But on the ground, when they're starting to adjudicate some of these cases, I'm not sure exactly what's gonna happen yet. So there's a lot of uncertainty for family petition. And I will say, and I'm gonna stress it, this is mostly applicable for family petitions. That is the one area where really public charge comes into play. And those folks, I will recommend to talk to an attorney or a DOJ accredited rep to see if public charge would apply to them. In those cases, I will absolutely give that advice. Absolutely. But the problem is that people are not even gonna do that. Again, when I talk to those families in the school, in, in San Rafael High School, none of them have even talked to an attorney about their own immigration case. So this is adding to the chilling effect. People are gonna shy away from getting benefits, people are not gonna to wanna to have the children enroll in benefits, and we know the consequences in the economy, and just about, not even talking about the humanitarian consequences, but the consequences in the economy about these things. There's corner shops that are, you know, are depending on this type of supplemental assistance to pay for food, and they use that. Community clinics survive because of medical reimbursements. So if they don't get those reimbursements, or the stores are not getting people buying food, and you start going to the emergency room because you don't even want to go to the doctor, and you don't want to enroll in ACA or cover California because you're worried, imagine the impact that's going to have. So, and the worst part of this is that the DHS in the proposal even recognizes this. And they know that there's gonna be an impact because of the chilling effect. And I would like to also be clear and say, well, I know exactly how this is gonna play out, but to be honest, I can say what is happening now on the ground. And what the current rules are, are very narrow, they're rarely being applied, and the rule still has not been implemented. So what also I think you can tell people, well, think about this enrolling carefully because the rule is not even still in play. So if you have a U visa, which even not even applies to you anyway, but you also tell them the rule is not even being enacted. This is a proposed rule. We still don't know what the final, what the final rule is going to look like. Then that's another way to perhaps get people more comfortable about accessing benefits they're eligible for. Of course, never lie to get public benefits, and this is something you have to tell, always been the message from our part, you should, not, you should never lie when you are disclosing your income so that you make sure you're actually eligible for the benefits that you are applying to. That has to be the message as well. So again, chilling effect, you're totally right. That is exactly what worries me and what worries a lot of applicants. And we will respond. So once the final rules are being enacted and we know kind of what's really going to happen, we will have consultations and workshops for people to come for cons to to get legal advice on this on these issues. Um, but in the meantime, if you can just go to the public comments, that would be incredibly helpful for for people. And we can do also trainings. Lauren can go and train other people that are providing services on this on this matter. And there's a public charge working group in Marin County, by the way, that has the Department of Homeland Security. I'm sorry, DHS, DHHS, which is Department of Health and Human Services, organizations like Canal Alliance, First Five Marin, Marin Community Foundation, in which we are going to start lining up more trainings on this on this issue as well. Any questions? Oh, wow, you guys are so clear on public charge. <laughs> Maybe I should quiz you to see. <laughs> Believe me, I, I, I understand it. It seems really overwhelming. It does seem overwhelming, and I can see why. But just getting informed on these issues really helps the community you serve, because that way you don't continue with this, you know, rumors and, and all of these things that are happening to, to our families. Yes? You know, what frightens me, though, is that you have to assume all that confusion in that language is deliberate because they're, these are evil people that are writing these obfuscating, and they have an idea of how they're going to use it. And, we, and they don't want anybody to understand. And, and the other thing on public comment, you know, with the FCC, 80% of the public comment of 70, 80 was keep net neutrality, and they wiped that out anyway. You know, we're dealing, you've got to consider who we're dealing with. These are profoundly evil people. Yeah. I
appreciate your I candor. <laughs> I would, yes, and it is true. I'm not going to tell you, go and do this, and I'm sure everything's going to be fine. No, I cannot say this either because we already know what's happening with families at the border. We already know what the administration is capable of doing. Without me using adjectives, you can see for yourself what the government and what extent they are willing to go to damage immigrants and people of color and low income people in this country. This is a deliberate agenda, and this is part of that agenda. I, I concur. If you don't have any more questions, please know that you can always contact Lauren, and we can organize an event or uh, train the trainer or any kind of public service information or community event. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.